good morning or a good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome. I am Yulia Joja, Senior Fellow at um, the Middle East Institute's Frontier Europe Initiative, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's event, um, the EU in the Black Sea, Can the Eastern Partnership Provide Security? MEI's Frontier Europe Initiative, launched in 2019, um, explores the Black Sea as a key um, region for transatlantic security. And with today's event um, that is part of our effort to Black, for Black Sea um, security and dialogue, we will look at the European Union's Eastern um, Europe uh, security and enlargement policy with a focus on Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine. We are fortunate to be joined um, today by Kristina Gerasimov, Stefan Meister and Andreas Umland, who will lend their perspectives on EU Eastern policy. And I'm honored to welcome um, Dr. Kristina Gerasimov, Foreign Policy Advisor to Moldova's President Maya Sandu since 2021, um, January. Uh, Christina was recently a research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, where she worked on EU Eastern Partnership. Um, she also worked on security and defense for Transparency International and on Russia and Eurasia for the Chatham House in London. Welcome, Christina, and congratulations on your new appointment. Um, I, on my part, am confident that Moldova's foreign policy in the, is in the right hands. Um, it is also uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stefan Meister, um, who is the head of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in uh, the TBBC office, South Caucasus region, since um, July 2019. Before Tbilisi, Stefan um, was the head of the Robert Bosch Center for Central and Eastern Europe of the very same German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, a coincidence, but um, not a surprise, um, we have done our best today to get Europe's finest Eastern experts, and many of them are, are at the DGAP. Um, previously, Stefan worked um, for the European Council on Foreign Relations and is an author of numerous books and studies on East-West relations, including um, a recent excellent strategic paper on the Black Sea for the Bell Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Stefan. And finally, last but not least, I would like to welcome um, Andreas Umland, research fellow at um, the Russia and Eurasia program at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs in Stockholm. Andreas is also a senior researcher at the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation in Kiev and principal expert at, um, Ukraine, at the Ukrainian Institute um, for the Future, also in Kiev. He worked and taught at Stanford University in Yekaterinburg, um, at the University of Oxford in Kiev and in Germany, and published numerous books as well in studies on the post-Soviet space in Eastern European um, politics. Andreas, um, thank you for joining. To read um, the full bios of today's distinguished speakers, please visit MEI's website. Um, I look forward to taking audience questions through Zoom's Q&A feature, um, which you can find on your screens. For those calling in by phone or watching our panel on the live stream, you can ask a question by emailing events at mei.edu or tweeting us at uh, MEI Frontier. If you have technical issues, please email events at mei.edu. Um, feel free to ask a question at any time um, throughout the panel. I will be looking at all of your questions and will fa factor as many um, as possible into um, today's discussion. Um, and then uh, let us begin at the EU it, uh, and its member states have recently amped up discussions around Europe's strategic autonomy and European security, including through a revived Eastern partnership and discussions around that. Um, but the EU's open door policy towards Eastern partnership countries with association agreements um, like Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine um, actually lacks political support uh, among the EU member states. And furthermore, the EU and its member states um, remain largely absent from military conflicts and Black Sea security generally. And while some Eastern partnership countries are on a committed path towards EU membership, the EU lacks a coherent um, security policy for its East and struggles for a consensus-based enlargement policy in its neighborhood. Um, the promise of a renewed transatlantic ties um, under a Biden administration could 
serve as an incentive for a consolidated EU security policy in the Black Sea region. And um, that is part of what we're trying to explore in our discussion today. Um, let me um, ask my first question to Andreas. Um, the EU Council President Claude Michel is traveling soon to Kiev um, and the Donbass in Ukraine. Um, and uh, to what extent do you believe um, that both security and the Eastern partnership will be on the agenda of the EU-Ukraine meeting? And how do you um, generally assess um, right now the bilateral relations between the EU and Ukraine? Well, I guess it depends on, on how broad you define security. I think the um, Ukrainian side here would like to talk more about um, uh, sort of traditional concepts of security and uh, not in the sort of more resilience focused uh, uh, larger interpretation of the uh, term security. Um, the expectation here was, of course, after 2014 that the EU would uh, provide as some of the um, articles uh, of the association agree agreement actually say also more sort of hard security um, uh, in a narrow sense uh, help for Ukraine, but that has not happened. Instead, the, um, uh, the EU has engaged in um, a number of programs um, in help with the IDPs in decentralization and infrastructure programs that are and energy saving and so on that are of course very important for Ukraine but that do not actually um, address the main security issues um, in the Donbas or not or do not address them at least directly in um, in the Donbas or uh, regarding um, um, uh, Crimea and there, there was even this paradox that um, uh, two countries of the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, that are still officially included in the Eastern Partnership, namely Armenia and Belarus, voted in March uh, 2014 uh, with Russia um, in the UN resolution uh, that condemned the um, annexation of Crimea. They, both, country has, uh, both countries have then taken a more nuanced position Armenia and Belarus, although they voted for, uh, for Russia, but um, well, we can simply say that you know the EU had no through the Eastern Partnership pro program no leverage here um, on these two member countries mem or, or participants of the Eastern Partnership program to to make them vote with with the with the EU members in the uh, United Nations to condemn the. Crimea. That's why I don't expect here anything um, big from this visit. Uh, um, and simply, the EU has since 2014 defined its role as as not being active here in in the in security affairs um, in a narrow sense, uh, which which is odd in a way because the uh, one of the um, reasons that, that Russia was sort of so critical of this association agreement uh, was uh, the security relate were the security related articles in the association agreement um, but then when the emergency situation appeared in 2014 and the association agreement was finally signed and then ratified and fully went into force in 2016 actually nothing came about from the EU at least from some member countries of the EU um, um, there was some um, in, in a more narrow sense, security help uh, from Poland, from Lithuania, but not from the EU um, as an institution. So I expect um, this um, this visit also to remain within this general framework of EU support for um, Ukrainian reforms, for decentralization, and for addressing such issue, issues as the internally displaced um, pers um, persons uh, within um, within Ukraine. That is perhaps the one issue that is actually related uh, at least remotely to um, to security that uh, where the EU uh, gets um, gets actually involved thank you Stefan and I'd love to um, you picked up on on uh, something that I was going to ask you um, during the conversation in terms of the Eastern partnership and lumping um, six countries together when they actually have differing um, 
um, uh, orientations when it comes to East and West. Um, but, but later on that, let me follow up um, in, in the context of this um, regional visit really from the EU um, uh, Council and its president um, by turning to Stefan. Um, uh, Claude Michel is currently um, uh, in Tbilisi and we have recently seen political statements um, from Georgia that it will apply for EU membership in 2024. So um, in your view, security or membership or political um, stability, what is um, what was and what should have been on the agenda in terms of um, common achievements in the bilateral relationship between Georgia and um, the EU. Thank you, Julia. Thank you also for the invitation <clears throat> and the question. Maybe a couple of words um, on Jean Michel's visit and the current situation in Georgia. I think this is this is also very important because since the parliamentary election in October 2020, we have a we have a do domestic political crisis in Georgia. Um, opposition parties did not uh, recognize uh, the result of the e election and demand snap, snap elections. Um, and um, there is a strong uh, involvement of the US ambassador and also the EU ambassador to, to negotiate between opposition and uh, the ruling party, a Georgian dream. Um, and uh, right into this, uh, uh, Charles, Mich Charles Michel just, just came um, uh, into Tbilisi um, and he visited, he met, he met everybody here. Yeah, so he was also on the ABL, uh, on, the, on the Abkhazian um, borderline um, I, today. Uh, and he met all opposition and also the official side. Um, and uh, as I have heard, um, uh, there was a positive response uh, from both sides. He, bo he, he got from both the confirmation that they again will talk with each other uh, and also snap elections uh, are still on the table. So there is somehow, I, I'm not so sure, so sure if there's a breakthrough, but I would at least say uh, there's some kind of positive outcome. On the, um, on the role of the EU for, um, for Georgia, um, I think the main crisis of Georgia is at the moment the pandemic. Yeah, so we have a huge economic, socioeconomic crisis. Um, we, have, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have a big gray sector, yeah, where, where people don't get income at the moment. This country is completely dependent on tourism. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and and I think this is really a big, big, big crisis. And I think the EU already helped quite a lot of uh, with with some funding, also support um, uh, in the health sector of the pandemic. I think that was really important, also as a, as a, as a message, as a statement, but also in terms of really uh, direct help or direct support. Um, EU is here also with a EU monitoring mission um, in Ab on the borderline to Abkhazia and South Ossetia uh, present. Um, yeah, so I think it is on the ground, but I think um, we have also to say um, the main conflict last year here was the war on Karabakh. Yeah, and this has an impact on the entire region. It's changing, um, it's changing also the, the geopolitical um, situation in the region and the EU was completely absent from this conflict. The OC Minsk group was just out of, of any negotiations and, and it was mainly Russia who made the shots. So I think this is what the Georgians really very much watch also, how the geopolitical shift is taking place, what the new US president will also do, will he engage more again in, into the region? Um, and then it's all about security. If you want to have transformation, if you want to have um, uh, democratization, in, um, I think you need also a kind of security. And for me, security is also about rule of law. It's also about corruption. Um, uh, yeah, because these are the areas where um, if you have informal rules, uh, if you have corruption, it's much more easy for a country like Russia, for instance, to interfere in, in, in your domestic politics. And I think that's something the EU could be much more active. Disinformation is a big issue here. Yeah, I think you uh, could be also more, more active. But I think, and we will discuss this maybe also later, um, the question for me is what happens at the moment in the Black Sea region, how the balance of power is changing at the moment, and what impact this will have also on trade, uh, on, the uh, on, the, on the relations among the, the, the uh, literal states in, in, uh, in, on the Black Sea region, and also on the democratic development of, of, of the countries like, like Georgia. 
Thank you, Stefan. Um, you've, you've also highlighted um, a couple of things um, regarding security and how much um, the EU could be doing more, at least on the soft security side, if it doesn't venture into um, the hard security side, um, that is maybe now the biggest issue around the Black Sea on a regional level. Um, let me turn to Christina. Um, Christina, what about the EU Council visit to Moldova? Unlike Georgia and Ukraine, um, Moldova is constitutionally neutral and does not want to join NATO, at least for now, and has a complicated relationship with the EU, borrowing from the Eastern Partnership model country a few years ago through ambiguity in the public opinion between East and West orientation, um, all the way to withheld EU reform funding when Moldova did not keep its um, reform pace. Um, so now with um, a new, um, with highly supported um, public support president um, in place, but with political instability uh, in, inside Moldova, where do you see EU-Moldova relations at the moment and, and where are they heading? Thank you, Julia, and thank you very much for, for this invite. It is great to see you and also good friends on this uh, panel from various strands of life. Um, in terms of the visit of Charles Michel to Chisinau um, on his Eastern tour to Georgia and to Ukraine, what I could say is that definitely this was a follow-up visit to President Sandu's visit to Brussels earlier this year in, in January. And I think it is very clear uh, that President Sandu's agenda is really to defreeze the relations with the, with the West. Moldova had quite stranded relations with, uh, with the Western partners under the former president Dodon for quite uh, some years. There weren't too many visits at uh, the high level both ways. And uh, uh, you know, on top of the difficult and tense political situation in the country, that did not uh, uh, help the uh, EU-Moldova relations. So from this uh, perspective, I would say that the visit of the president of the European Council uh, was really a very strong message of support, uh, of support, first of all, uh, to the reform agenda of President Sandu, uh, to uh, the vision of the need for reforms on rule of law, anti-corruption in Moldova as the key sectors that will unleash the potential of the country. I think this was made very clear. Also, I think a, a strong message that was delivered uh, by Charles Michel was that the opening that will come from Brussels is very much dependent on the political will uh, in, in Chisinau. And uh, considering the state of affairs in Chisinau today, um, the um, situation is quite tense in the sense that uh, the citizens and uh, the everyone understands that this deadlock can uh, only be uh, over uh, past if there are uh, early elections, um, because the uh, former parliamentary elections are not representative anymore in terms of the of the uh, content of of the parliament today. However, with um, if everyone agreed that there is a need for these snap elections at the end of the year, um, once in January, the polls kicked in uh, for the political parties if there were elections next week, it was very clear that the former party of the current uh, President Sando would uh, uh, gain uh, over 40% of, of, of the votes, if not very close to 50. And therefore, the most of, 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 of the parties with the, the socialists uh, uh, leading in a way reversed their understanding of the need of having immediate uh, uh, snap election. So here I would say that this visit was also a message that Moldova needs stability and a way for this stability is to find a, 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 you know, a polite uh, uh, solution through political dialogue how to get to, to, to early elections. What was discussed in this meeting was of course how to get the vaccine faster. I think Moldova is uh, lucky that it got uh, its first lot of vaccines from Romania uh, last uh, Saturday and uh, another lot will come through the COVAX platform. So there were discussions of how things could move forward in terms of faster vaccination. EU assistance was uh, of course discussed in the, you know, in the perspective of the follow-up of the visit, um, uh, the future priorities for, for the relationship uh, between the EU and Moldova as well as, as the Eastern Partnership. I think it's very clear for everyone that the Eastern Partnership 
partnership is in the second very important year uh, in terms of defining the future priorities. And I think here, uh, not only uh, the presidential office, but I think also the government is very clear on the fact that uh, they would like to see a differentiation of the three countries that are willing to have closer ties with, with the EU. Um, so from, from this perspective, I would say this, this, is, this was the agenda of the discussion, but it did not move, let's say, things significantly forward. It was a, a visit of, of support. It sent a strong uh, message of support to, to President Sando. Thank you, Christina. And, and let me follow up with another question um, to you, um, because we marked today 29 years since the war in Transnistria started. Um, for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Moldova. And today, Transnistria remains unresolved as a European security issue. Um, how can we think about the EU's um, security partnerships and security policy in the region? Can the EU, in your uh, view, do more for overall Black Sea security and for the specific issues um, that Moldova is, um, is uh, facing in, in terms of security, but are also partially shared uh, with neighbors like um, Ukraine and, and Georgia. Um, thank you, Yulia. Indeed, today is a, is a big day for, for, for the country. Um, but if we take it in a macro perspective, I think the Black Sea is relatively a new neighborhood for, for the EU since Bulgaria and Romania joined in 2007. And the security dimension for the EU is also in a way not something that the EU has been feeling very comfortable with, especially when we speak about the EU exercising it in, 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 uh, at its eastern uh, borders. So when we speak about the Black Sea, the Eastern Partnership and, and security, to me, it is in a way um, obvious that these don't sit together very well, particularly with the, with the old EU member states. Um, and it, it's clear that for the EU, the perspective on the Black Sea is mainly comes from an economic angle, from a trade relationship, from an economic development uh, aspect. And here, of course, the focus is on the Black Sea Synergy Initiative uh, um, that was established by Bulgaria and Romania. At the same time, you know, this, the, this perspective comes really in tension with the fact that the EU's uh, Eastern neighborhood is a very contested environment where the security developments cannot be ignored. And, and the countries in this basin are, are marred by constant challenges. Um, still to me, um, well, if, if we look from a European perspective, it is of course NATO that is the crucial security provider or the security partner in, in the Black Sea uh, uh, region rather than uh, the EU itself uh, as an organization. Um, the EU as such has never had really a strong security and the military dimension to, 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 to its identity. But I think as we move forward with this narrative that the EU wishes or desires to be, you know, a strategic sovereign actor in the future as it aspires to, to be, um, I think these inclusion, these dimensions have to be really, really tackled. And from this perspective, you know, the uh, engaging with security sector reform in Georgia, in Moldova, in Ukraine is really a key for, for the EU. But for this, it needs to develop new tools. Uh, as Stefan has mentioned, we've seen, uh, you know, the, the, the way how the EU responded to the developments in, 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 in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, 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 through the OECE. Uh, and and this is, there, there could have been done much, much more. And I think there is more or less of, of, of a consensus that, uh, that the EU does not dispose this toolbox uh, when it comes to, to, to security developments in, 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 in the region. Um, at the same time, I think that individual EU member states are very much interested to, to help. Uh, and uh, we do see signs and openings from individual member states. And I think a way forward for these countries is if there is no yet political will on behalf of the EU to move forward with a security dimension for the Eastern Partnership, or at least for these three countries, uh, then they should move with smaller coalitions of the willing or with individual EU member states uh, that are indeed interested to, to help. I'll stop here.
Thank you, Christina. Highlight an allusion to Poland and Romania to do more. <laughs> um, so um, with, with these things in mind, um, uh, Stefan, on the Black Sea, you pointed out security is thin, EU security is thin. Um, the EU has three missions in three countries in the three countries that we're talking about combined with all missions being civilian and the EU largely absent from all um, frozen or active conflicts in terms of really providing security. And the current EU security strategy lacks a comprehensive Eastern European security dimension despite dating from 2016. Um, and EU positions on Russia, as we mentioned, all of us um, uh, in a way or another um, before um, are highly disputed. So um, where do you see avenues that remain also um, based on what Christina was mentioning earlier coalitions of the willing, um, different instruments and programs, um, underexplored avenues for European security in the East? I think um, for me, the main, um, the, the fundamental problem is that um, the EU does not see uh, Black Sea region really as a priority. And it does not understand uh, also the Black Sea region as a wider security complex. Um, yeah, which is also linked with the Mediterranean uh, and the Middle East, which links the Caspian Sea um, uh, with, via the South Caucasus and the Black Sea with Europe. Um, the EU is very active in, um, in, in economic um, transformation, um, yeah, also in, um, uh, in supporting um, pipelines, um, but also um, uh, infrastructure, yeah, for, 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 for transit. Um, and I think it has several policies um, so this Black Sea synergy, it is involved in, in conflict mediation also in, in most of the conflicts. It has its neighborhood policy. Um, for me, the main problem is that there is lack of, a, of an entire strategy. You have several policies in parallel, um, but uh, they, they, they have not much contact with each other. Yeah, they're not much linked with each other. And I think without a comprehensive strategic debate about the importance of the Black Sea, but also the links which the Black Sea gives to other regions um, and where are other players involved. So it's not just about Georgia, Ukraine um, and, and Moldova, it's, but it's, it's, it's also about Russia and Turkey, yeah, for instance. So it's also about Iran, it's about other players um, which impact the developments in the region. And I think um, that's the, the main deficit that there is there is there is not this strategic debate and it's it's just starting now yeah so so and, and i think how it can start is uh, yeah how it, it's always working in the eu it's 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 a coalition of of interested uh, member states yeah so it's the member states who drive these policies of of the eu and if the member states are not interested um, or they are too weak or there are only two of them um, yeah so um, and they are not the biggest one um, then it's 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 very difficult yeah so but i um, I think there is a growing understanding that things are changing in our neighborhood, and if we are not impacting and, uh, on it, it will change us without uh, our uh, our influence. Yeah, you can you can say um, yeah. So, and I um, I I think really to um, yeah, I think for me security, as I already mentioned, is about also corruption. It's about legal reforms. Um, it's about also. Providing peacekeeping, for instance, being EU has this, this, for instance, this new project EU for dialogue, yeah, for for um, uh, for the Georgian conflict zones, uh, but also for Transnistria. Um, uh, so it's quite a uh, multi-layer project. Um, but I think you 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 can you need to link also this kind of um, mediation um, also with the willingness for peacekeeping, um, with the with more investment also in multilateral platforms. And you cannot stay absent in uh, in 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 Abkhazia, uh, in, in um, not in Abkhazia, in in um, Karabakh, yeah, Nagorno Karabakh, um, when 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 things are changing fundamentally, yeah. So, and I think, um, yeah, that's the problem. You, it's nice to have all these civil uh, means, um, but uh, hard power uh, is is playing a role, as we have seen it in the Karabakh conflict. Um, and if we see also how the, 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 the security situation is changing in the Black Sea region, how we have the military built up around Crimea, um, how South Ossetia is also used yeah, from the Russian side um, uh, with this military built up, I think it's, it's, yeah, it needs really a rethink and um, it, needs, it needs more than, yeah, it needs this linking these kind of different strategies. Um, uh, it needs also 
the question with the legal reforms, how to, uh, how to really have more impact on legal reforms, how to really seriously fight corruption. Andreas can talk about Ukraine, yeah, what's going on there. Moldova has still the big problems. Um, Georgia is now is, uh, democratically backsliding at the moment. Yeah, we have, we have more informal rules, you have more corruption. Uh, yeah, so I think you can do more here, uh, but you have to you have to develop also yourself as a relevant player in the security field in the region if you want to negotiate or bargaining with players like like Russia um, or Turkey about security in your neighborhood. Thank you, Stefan, um, for this uh, tour de force in, in, in what uh, can be done um, and, and where the problems lie. Uh, let me just um, make another quick shout out to the audience. We're looking forward to um, addressing all of your questions and comments, so please feel free to send them um, via the Q&A function here in Zoom. Um, and let me um, turn to Andreas and something that you mentioned earlier and our other um, panelists um, discussed a bit too, lumping um, six um, uh, countries into the Eastern partnership when clearly they have different priorities and different needs. How can we think about the Eastern partnership ahead in terms of differentiating on one side between association agreement countries and, and those that are not or are in the Eurasian um, Economic Union? And on the other side, moving these association agreement countries on bilateral relations or as a, as a group um, uh, towards more um, EU integration, whatever that may mean. Um, so you mentioned um, that, the lumping together. And then the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, apropos coalitions of the willing that we a bit, a bit discussed, um, Ukraine is um, heading this major initiative of a Crimea platform where all um, uh, UN um, member states that have uh, voted for the resolution in 2014 against um, Russian aggression will be invited um, this summer um, to, to the Crimean platform, including with a big hope of, of a Biden administration high level um, uh, presence. Is this also something that we can think about in terms of outside EU, uh, EU structures, um, bringing together countries willing and able to make a difference to European uh, Eastern security and Black Sea security? So two questions here for you, Andreas. Um, lumping together Eastern partnership and uh, Crimea platform and ways ahead. Okay. Uh, my I think it's uh it's better actually without them. I'm sorry. <laughs> then I'll have to try and put one uh, this way. Uh, I hope uh, you can understand that there were some complaints about the uh, the quality, the audio quality. I've heard a lot about the business. Well, Ukraine was always um, a bit unhappy, um, and I'm now trying to speak very loudly or as loudly as I can um, about the Eastern Partnership Program because it, I, I thought um, that it was ill-conceived, um, uh, not only for the reason that different countries were lumped together, but also um, uh, in that Ukraine thought of itself uh, at least some politicians here as more, being more important than the smaller countries and they didn't want to have a sort of a special treatment for the EU that um, it, it did not uh, receive to the extent that it uh, expected to. And, and as I already mentioned, there was then this uh, disappointment in 2014 when Iran and Belarus um, at least partly supported uh, Russia in the annexation of Crimea. And um, since then, I, I guess uh, um, the reputation here of the Eastern Partnership has, has even come further down. Um, I guess Stefan can, uh, uh, can tell a whole different story about the, um, the relationship of Azerbaijan and Armenia within the Eastern Partnership. So I think there is a very strong argument here to be made for for this differentiation and uh, for a separate treatment. Although now, um, oddly, with regard to Belarus, we may be end actually ending up again um, in a situation where Belarus could actually um, sort of move uh, into this uh, category of perhaps more 
EU-oriented um, uh, countries if, if, if there is a, a fundamental change um, in Belarus. Uh, um, some complaint here is, of course, and I, I, I guess it is the same for Moldova and Georgia, is that there is no membership uh, perspective included in the association agreement. Or there was a discussion uh, about that um, to include the formulation into the preamble of the association agreement. That is what also everybody is expecting here, and um, uh, that is something that uh, that is missing. But but that's of course a very old story, and that that has been just discussed already dozens um, dozens of times. Times. I think the um, idea of the Crimea platform, which um, sounds um, at first glance perhaps a bit pathetic, um, in, to sort of um, formulate it that way and, and to include uh, all sorts of countries into that, and um, also perhaps uh, in a way uh, fantastic in in terms of the sort of uh, uh, continuing Russian assertiveness with, with regard to Crimea, where uh, Russia does not even uh, allow any discussion of the Crimea issue. Um, uh, that uh, in, uh, against this background, the Crimea platform may may look like a deadlock uh, or something uh, you know out of out of the blue at the at the moment. But uh, we should not forget that Russia has driven itself. Uh, over the last seven years into a complicated situation in Crimea in that it has not yet addressed the issue of um, fresh water uh, delivery uh, in Crimea, um, the North Crimean Canal, uh, which uh, provided uh, over 80% of the fresh water for Crimea until 2014 was closed. And oddly enough, um, Russia has not uh, done anything to, to resolve this, uh, this problem sustainably, and um, I'm afraid this, um, this problem will uh, only accelerate with, uh, with every year. And um, it is now already even more complicated, perhaps um, a bit late, because the, um, the building of, let's say, desalination plants in on Crimea would take two or three years, but the, but the um, problems with fresh water uh, supply are already now uh, mounting, and um, they may become even more grave in the next, uh, um, in the next months, but perhaps even already um, this summer. So, um, I think the, um, the Crimea will not remain an issue. Um, it is not something that it's not a frozen situation. Um, it, uh, it is in a way a time bomb, and, and therefore creating this platform is actually uh, very apt. And uh, so I think it's um, it's a, it's something um, the, the, the solution of the Crimea problem may be as far. As, um, as I think, uh, at least I would say so, in view of the fresh water problem, if that's not uh, resolved in some way uh, soon and effectively and sustainably, then, um, then uh, we will have to expect some sort of change uh, because the, uh, the, the peninsula cannot uh, exist for, long, uh, for much longer anymore without some sort of sustainable uh, solution for this uh, problem. Um, perhaps if I may add uh, something to, uh, to what um, Christina and Stefan had have said um, uh, already before is that there is an even um, more fundamental problem in the, uh, the relationship between the EU and the Eastern Partnership countries in that there is actually, as I would see it, and I think many Ukrainians you see it at least that, um, that way, there is a fundamental uh, security um, contradiction here in that um, uh, the EU has defined uh, Russia as being important for its energy security. Um, so, as an uh, as an exporter of uh, energy, and um, it so happens that Russia is a petro state, and Russia needs um, uh, uh, these in uh, this income from the exports of uh, of its energy, uh, oil, gas, and and coal. And the EU is a, is a major importer of Russian energy. 
key, and uh, you know it's no secret that the um, the state budget of Russia and uh, the entire economy of Russia is very much reliant on this on these um, exports, and a large part of these exports goes goes to. Um, so there is actually. Uh, uh, your um, uh, fundamental security issue that an increase of energy security for the EU um, that includes Russia decreases security of such Eastern partnership countries as Russia, Georgia and especially Ukraine because they are uh, they have territorial conflicts with, uh, with Russia. So um, that is actually quite a fundamental issue. And the other one here is uh, inter interdependence problem uh, that is. Uh, an approach that is especially uh, popular in, in Germany as an entire philosophy that you should have um, uh, economic interdependence with other countries that then creates uh, a more peaceful environment for your own country. And that is basically the philosophy of these uh, pipeline deals, uh, the other ones already in the 1970s, and the recent pipeline deals, Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2. Um, but interdependence theory applies, of course, also to um, the Ukrainian-Russian relations. And so the increase of um, economic interdependence between, let's say, Germany or the entire EU and Russia and the power of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 decreases the interdependence between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. And that is another fundamental, I think, security uh, confrontation contradiction here that uh, I think is not openly, uh, not, uh, um, uh, not frankly enough addressed in, in, in many of the discussions that simply the EU increases its security at the cost of countries like Ukraine, Georgia, and uh, and Moldova by building these uh, these pipelines, which are good for for EU security, energy security, which are also good for EU military security, because they make Russia dependent on the uh, on the EU market, but they are bad for um, for a country like Ukraine that used to have this uh, economic interdependence with, with Russia that has been already reduced with the first Nord Stream and that may now be reduced with the second Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, and so I think that's something that, that needs to be frankly addressed in, in the overall discussion. There is, I think, too much good discussion that we have here about you know, decentralization and IDPs and energy saving and so on and and uh, these, these hard security issues they are not um, um, well enough addressed and they often seem to rather in that way in some of the West European capitals. Thank you, Andreas, and uh, thank you for highlighting the Nord Stream 2 problem. I think on this side of the Atlantic, on both sides of the political spectrum, people are now cheering. <laughs> um, but um, but for, for highlighting that, and I think um, Georgia is in a similar situation with the new evolutions, um, Stefan, that you pointed out in um, the um, Nagorno-Karabakh and, and transit country Georgia moving to um, uh, transit um, somewhere else, which decreases their geopolitical um, status as transit countries, but there is a question that I'd like to ask you, a difficult one, Stefan, from the audience. Um, the conflict in Karabakh um, has been um, resolved last autumn or winter, actually, um, and currently Russia and Turkey, together with Azerbaijan, are dealing with um, st stabilization and reintegration uh, matters, including opening of communications and transport corridors. Um, where do you see a role, if at all, within the new realities for the EU to contribute? And I know it's a difficult question because um, Nagorno-Karabakh II um, war meant um, new borders um, with the West staying away, both the EU and the United States. Um, so do you see any avenues for the EU to um, become a, a regional player and make a difference to um, South Caucasus security? Yes, I see. So I, um, um, I think uh, we have to first of all to understand um, the conflict has not been resolved. Yeah. So we have a ceasefire agreement, but we don't have a peace agreement. We had a war where Azerbaijan, which Azerbaijan has won, uh, and it had to stop at one point because Russia stopped uh, Azerbaijan. 
uh, but we have more haters now. Uh, we have those under pressure uh, who who were for peace and, and uh, reconciliation between both countries. It's even more difficult now to find a, find really a, a solution of this conflict. And the ceasefire agreement hasn't um, uh, answered key questions, for instance, like the status um, of Nagorno-Karabakh. So I think key issues have not been solved and they need to be solved. Um, uh, and I, I just don't see that Russia or Turkey are the right countries um, to, to, to contribute to a peaceful settlement of, um, yeah, of one of the most deadly and um, tragic conflicts uh, we have um, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, it needs huge investment in, in Karabakh and in the seven uh, regions around Karabakh um, uh, to, to rebuild also these, uh, these regions. Um, and I, I think, um, I think it's, it's really a tragic what, what happens there. And I think it, it, it um, how to say it, I, um, uh, we have now this, the focus of the discussion is on this economic transit routes, on, on economic interests. But I really would like to see how this comes to reality. Uh, how, how it is possible with two enemies who just have fight a war with 6,500 um, people died yeah, in, in this war to build these kind of transit routes um, through partly of their territory of Turkey on one side and Russia on neither side, you, you, you can say. Yeah? So um, I, I, think, I think the EU's role is here to contribute to, to, to reconciliation, to peaceful um, uh, solution of this conflict to provide, and this is what I argued from the beginning, we need a multilateral platform um, for, um, for, this, for this conflict yeah, between both sides. We need uh, maybe OSC Minsk Group 2, uh, also with other, other countries coming in, um, like Germany or Sweden, for instance, um, strengthen this platform um, and, and really uh, find answers or negotiate also answers to, to, to what, what matters in, in this war. We have a lot of problems with, um, with pe people um, who are still not returned, for instance, to Armenia. Um, so I think the main, the main strength of the EU is completely missing here. Which is which is the the soft power, the way of of civil and peaceful um, um, and honest way also of solving a conflict, yeah. Um, and uh, I just don't see that Russia and Turkey can provide this. Um, and and I think that's the tragic. If if EU is not coming into this conflict um, in, as a as a as as, a, as another actor, I just don't know who should provide this this part. Um, that's an interesting. Interesting um, take on the issue, and, and it leads back to um, the uh, inherent problems of the Black Sea that we're all facing frozen, sometimes unfrozen, temporarily unfrozen conflicts where um, uh, negotiations um, for, um, uh, for peaceful settlements are led by um, the by, by the ones initiating conflicts or actively participating instead of international um, negotiation and the EU um, either being sidelined or um, as we've seen in, in 2014 and even earlier, um, bringing in um, not um, the EU institutions as, as representing a unified um, Russia policy, but rather um, uh, great powers of the EU, usually France, uh, usually Germany with the Ostpolitik and then France being kind of pulled in because they focus usually on the South. Um, but. But, uh, but overall, uh, with, whether with the Minsk agreements or, or other types of agreements um, in the region, this has not been sustainable as we've seen over the last now 29 years with Transnistria today. Um, there's, um, there's also a question on the, uh, as follow up on the Eastern Partnership um, for Christina. Um, regarding um, the homogeneous future of the um, Eastern Partnership, um, or should there be a separate tailor-made approach dealing with, uh, with one or the other? And I would um, tailor this question or narrow it even more down, given the differences between countries within the Eastern Partnership with association agreements, Ukraine and Georgia wanting to clearly join on, on the Western um, also military front, um, but, but um, Moldova being in a different situation, wanting to join the European Union, um, but not taking that hard security path. Um, how do you see, um, with all your studies on the Eastern Partnership and now um, representing Moldova, how do you see this, um, this, this lumping together or not? And what's the beneficial, from your perspective, way to go ahead um, with the Eastern Partnership in terms of a uh, potential reform? 
Thank you, Julia. Um, I think, of course, the answer is different depending on what side you're looking at at, 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 uh, at the region. Are you looking with, from within the region or are you looking from, from the EU or even across the, the Atlantic? I think it's very clear that as the EU is a multi-speed Europe, the same is with the Eastern Partnership. It's a multi-speed neighborhood. And I think this is a fact that we need to, to acknowledge. Um, countries have associated, three countries have associated uh, association agreements. They have the visa-free regimes. They have intensified political uh, dialogue already, you know, uh, in place, and that is already constituting a lot of differentiation, I would say, among the the, the three associated countries and, and, and the other three. But I think what's probably a better perspective to look at what's a better lens, the multilateral or the, 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 the bilateral, I think we need to look at what are the challenges for this region in the future for, for the EU. And then depending on that, what solutions can be, you know, in what format the solutions can be reached uh, easier. And from this perspective, I think that there are three key challenges for the EU in, in, the, in the region for, for the next decade. One is, of course, you know, the fight against corruption and state capture in all of the six uh, countries. Another one is improving the security environment to, to help these countries uh, to, to unleash their developmental uh, potential. And on the third one, maybe not everyone agrees with me, but here I still see that, you know, there is a need to adapt these countries to the continent's environmental needs. I think this is something that will prove to be a problem for, for in, in, in the next decade. So if we look from this perspective, from the challenges of, 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 of the region, I think that a multilateral framework is, is necessary, necessary to, to, to tackle these, but it's definitely not sufficient to achieve sustainable uh, results. The solutions to, to such challenges have to be tailored, of course, to, to national uh, context to be able to, to maximize their, their impact. So here I would say, you know, that the multilateral component uh, or the, this one institutional framework really strengthens these countries' uh, leverage vis-a-vis -vis Brussels. You know, Georgia alone is not Georgia with Ukraine and Moldova or Georgia within the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, framework in, in Brussels. Um, it improves their visibility significantly. It can also lead to the creation of additional tools for the region to, to face common challenges in, in the EU, such as, you know, as, as it has already been mentioned by both Stefan and by Andreas, like energy security or, you know, environmental and climate resilience. But at the same time, I think the more recent developments, you know, once again reiterate the diversity of paths that these countries are taking. And um, in order to, to strengthen their sovereignty and their relations with, with, uh, with their direct neighbors, but also including with the EU. So from here, definitely, you know, uh, I would say a more tailored approach would definitely, you know, uh, better prepare the, the EU to respond to present, but also future crises, as well as undertake whatever new opportunities the, the region might bring in the future. Thank you, Christina. And we have just a few minutes um, left. So I'd like to wrap up um, with um, one final issue drawing slightly away from um, the EU itself. Um, but, um, but thinking ahead um, for, for the next um, three, four years or so, um, we have a new um, US Biden administration. And as I mentioned um, at the beginning of our um, discussion, um, there are heightened, um, of course, it was um, the, the news, the transatlantic news of the year that um, Biden was elected US president with the hopes particularly from Western European greater powers, but also from the Eastern side that new transatlantic ties will be forged and that the relationship um, will be um, embattered and, and developed. Um, but, but we do see after one month of a Biden administration that perhaps um, from the perspective of Western European countries um, with their own strategic um, culture and, and preferences, there is a bit of disappointment in that um, Biden's um, policy will continue, or at least is perceived to continue, a bit of a, in European terms, hawkish view when it comes to Russia and China, but for particularly Russia in the context of, of Eastern Europe. So with all that in mind, with the EU wanting to engage in stronger transatlantic ties, but on the other side trying to um, develop their defense and, and going maybe the strategic um, autonomy path or making some progress there, 
given our focus today on, on the Eastern partnership and the Eastern European space, um, do you see any avenues and the problems, right, or regarding on both sides um, that uh, Andreas mentioned with Nord Stream 2 and others, um, do you see just in one or two minutes as a wrap up, um, any ways ahead, any constructive, um, easily to implement ways ahead um, to work on Eastern European and Black Sea security um, with the transatlantic ties in mind. So bringing the US stronger in or bringing the EU through the US stronger in. Maybe Andreas, we can start with you and we'll do a quick round to um, wrap up. Here, the perspective would be how to um, do institutionally a step ahead. And since both concerning the EU and NATO, uh, there's no membership action plan possible so far uh, with regard to NATO. There's no membership perspective for the EU possible. There, but there are other, other avenues. So there were um, cooperation schemes that the US had for the Baltic countries, the so-called Baltic Charter, uh, which it now has for the uh, Western Balkan countries, the Adriatic Charter, something like that, an upgrade that means of the strategic partnership that the US has currently for Georgia and Ukraine work. Could imagine um, uh, perhaps a major non NATO ally status for Georgia and Ukraine, um, maybe um, an expansion of the Bucharest 9 group beyond the, the borders of NATO um, that would include perhaps uh, uh, countries like Georgia and NATO, or an expansion of the uh, Three Seas initiative. That is not something that Biden uh, can uh, can decide, but, but um, even the, I think the US can actually influence that so far the Three Seas Initiative is an intra-EU project, but uh, one could imagine that it could also include countries like Ukraine, uh, Doha, Georgia, perhaps even Belarus. Uh, I think these are just um, things that can be decided and that uh, Washington can, can work towards to, and um, uh, that where Biden can really, uh, if, it, if, if he wants, uh, make, make a substantive change in Eastern Europe. Um, thank you, Andreas, and over to you, Stefan. I think the uh, key question will be how much Biden will be absorbed by domestic um, issues. And I think it's, it's pretty clear that uh, the focus is on China. Uh, it's partly on Russia, but I think it is definitely China. And, and uh, I think there, there is no, so there is no, in this, there, is some, there are some changes, yeah, but I think this focus uh, will stay. Um, I think what, what had a strong impact on the Eastern Partnership countries what, were the crisis of the transatlantic relations, were um, also the spoilering um, of, of Trump uh, and Trump's populism. Um, and it is still the weakness of the EU, uh, which, um, um, how to say it, which, which for countries like Georgia, for instance, um, as the ma major focal points, this integration into the transatlantic structures, um, I think this has fooled the crisis we have now in, um, in Georgia, for instance. And I think uh, strengthening uh, transatlantic relations, also more normative policy, rule-based policy, is already useful in pushing back some, um, some developments we have in, in, in all the countries. Um, I, I think what will be important for Biden, and this is also part of cooperation, is rule of law. Um, uh, yeah, I think we can see this in Ukraine, but um, also in, um, in, in the other countries, there are these kind of, of statements. But I think what the US administration will also expect is, is burden sharing and it, it, that, the, that, is that the EU will supply also something in its neighborhood. Yeah, so it's it's EU's neighborhood, not the US neighborhood. And and uh, US might push back Russia here more than the EU would do, yeah, with some of the member states. Um, but I see re really here cooperation not only in hard security areas, I think I see it less, yeah, because the EU is so it's it's about NATO, it's not about EU, yeah. Um, but I see it really in this in these areas like legal reforms, uh, corruption, um, yeah, and, and and fighting back also this. This Russian, Russian, Russian impact of informal rule and 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 uh, yeah and uh, what I what I already mentioned. So I think here I can imagine, but I I mainly think that uh, good transatlantic relations already have an have an impact on on the region. 
Thank you, Stefan. And uh, may I give the last word very briefly to Christina? Um, anything you want to add um, uh, as a closing remark um, to our discussion today? Thank you very much, uh, Julia. I'm, I'm just afraid that I will repeat very much of what has already been stated because I also have a uh, you know, the same view that there could be done more uh, in terms of promoting rule of law, anti-corruption reform between the EU and, and the US in the region, not so much uh, on, on hard security issues, because to me, it still seems that the EU deals with serious internal challenges that uh, will, uh, will in a way consume most of, of the attention at least for the first uh, year. Uh, of course, I think what we had uh, in, the, in the previous four years have left uh, a security vacuum in, in, in the region. And I think there are high expectations that under a Biden administration, this will be changed. But I hear, uh, you know, very much agree with, with Stefan that uh, I think, you know, here China is seen in a way the challenge for, for the US rather than, uh, than Russia. And of course, the, 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 you know, the feeling of the neighborhood is, is very different for, for the US and, 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 um, and, and the EU in terms of, of uh, the Eastern Partnership neighbors. Here, I can only say that, um, you know, during Biden's visit to, to Kiev, he mentioned that Ukraine's uh, in back in you know when he was vice president uh, that he's uh, un under Obama administration that uh, the Ukraine's major security threat it's it's corruption, and I think this will probably still be a threat for for the next year, and this could also lead to a lot of uh, collaboration between the EU and and the US in the region. Thank you, Christina, and thank you to everyone. Um, I'm, I'm still practicing my American very close takeaway, very short. Um, so to me, for me, the takeaway right now is the EU is busy um, and um, the Biden administration is busy both with domestic affairs. So we have to wait for them um, to uh, make a difference to European security. And we need to talk about China more in the Eastern space. So I'll take that as a note. I want to thank um, the uh, distinguished panelists today. MEI Frontier Europe is really um, honored to have you um, for the first time hosting you here. I hope um, we'll have an opportunity to host you again. Thank you for our audience for listening in and sending us um, your questions. Um, and, and thank you um, everyone for, for taking part in this, um, what I hope was um, a very interesting and, and insightful discussion in the, uh, in the current um, affairs um, between European um, member states, the European Union, and um, the Eastern partners uh, within the with association agreement. So again, thank you for evening, and I uh, hope to see you soon on this platform or another. Bye bye. Thank you.